This is Ben Paris, Vice President of Operations for the Seminole County Chamber. You are about to hear Good Morning Seminole, our monthly signature event. This morning we're going to get into a discussion about what happened in the Surfside building collapse. We have an esteemed panel, and if you're used to the regular rhythm of how we do things, this one will be slightly different. We've got three sets of presenters, and each one will give a certain a, a portion of the story, and then they will all be up here for Q&A afterwards. And so with that, I want to recognize and welcome to the stage the first of our three presentations, and that's Joel Figueroa Valinas, president of SEP Engineering. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Come on up, Joel. Thank you, Jason, uh, and thank you for having me. It's important to discuss this, uh, this topic. A little bit about myself before we get into it. I'm a structural and forensics uh, engineer. I've been around the world, essentially, uh, investigating collapses. I was out there at Sandy as a first responder investigating structures. After the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake in 2010, I was out there trying to help design rapid structures to, to try to support some of the displaced Haitians and Dominicans across the border. And more recently, I've been providing expert analysis on the Surfside collapse. Before we get into the Surfside specifically, it's important to understand a little bit about Florida's code history. So prior to 1998, the state of Florida and essentially the country didn't have one consolidated set of building codes. You basically got to pick from four. And in 1981, after the collapse in Cocoa Beach of a five-story structure of very similar flat slab construction to Surfside, the state of Florida got together and actually enlisted the threshold inspection law to try to control quality during construction on some of these buildings to try to at least mitigate the, the potential of defects and, and collapse. But it wasn't really until after Hurricane Andrew came through that an international committee was formed in 1998, about six years after, and that's when the Florida Building Code 2001 first edition first came out, which was a consolidated code based on the International Code Council. You see up here some of the details of the Surfside complex. Uh, you can read through those bullet points, but the one part that's important that I want you to look at is that these buildings were constructed out of flat slab construction. These, these, these buildings had very little redundancy. What that means is sort of like a belts and suspenders, right? It's, you have a backup to a backup. And these buildings is basically a very flat floor concrete slab and the only thing supporting that is the connection between that and the and very thin uh, columns. So just keep that in mind. Now, this is a video that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. I'm going to try to walk through it if I can. Let me see if the pointer will work here. Perfect. So if, if you can still hear me, uh, if you can't hear me, please raise your hands because I'm going to try to turn here. Um, this is, this is a surveillance video. I've probably looked about, uh, at it about a couple of thousand times trying to analyze what, what happened. Uh, this is about a half a second in before the, the building starts collapsing. What I want you to look at is this front piece here, which is the piece that actually comes down first. And I want you to look at these two vertical white lines, which are some of the main supporting columns in the, in the front half of the building. If I advance this slightly, Okay, and stop, you will see that this front piece of the building is coming down first and it's almost getting dragged into the ground. And you'll also see, if you look very closely here, one of the columns actually broke. It snapped on the right side. Now, the thing about flat stop construction is that, oh, I think my pointer kind of went away. But the thing about flat slab construction is that once, once the collapse is initiated and these columns start punching through the floors, the floors actually add more weight onto themselves, which increases the force of gravity, which makes the collapse come down even quicker. It accelerates the speed at which the collapse happens. In the next slide, you will see that the front piece of the building, those front bays that were initially dragged, you will see the back half of the building 
has no choice but to also come down and actually rolls over the front piece, and you kind of see it there. You can see it starts rolling over the front piece as the, as the collapse continues. And if you notice, that's about another second into, into the collapse. This happens very, very quickly. In the next section of the video, you will see that now, because that center piece of the building is coming down and these floors are getting dragged down, those floors are connected to the left and the right side of the tower, so they actually try to drag the end towers inward, and you'll actually see that in the next piece. And you'll see that that right tower there will start leaning toward the left or toward the actual direction of the collapse. So you're probably wondering, why is the left tower not moving? Well, the left tower, ironically enough, was flat slab construction above, but in the garage and pool deck levels, it actually had beams. So when that dragging force actually tries to drag the left side of the tower, the beams actually resist that. The second reason is there's an elevator core there, which is a very, very strong part of the building. So between the elevator core and the beams, you can see that the left side of the tower sort of didn't, wasn't impacted as readily by that dragging force. But in the last couple of clips, you will see that the tower starts leaning, and then once it leans to a certain point, the load relative to gravity isn't straight anymore, so the columns can't take that force. But again, because it's a flat slab, instead of toppling over, the flat slab collapse is so sudden that it actually starts leaning and then it comes straight down, as you see there, okay? The reason that stood for about another second and a half, in, in our opinion, is because that piece of the structure was actually an addition that was added during construction, and that piece actually had twice as many columns as the center piece of the building. So even though it was still the same type of construction, it was actually a little stronger. But because that pulling force was so great, it destabilized the center of gravity of that right side of the tower, and that's what caused it to, to come down. So, so what now? So I'm, I'm part of a structural task force right now that's working to try to improve building codes, improve the way in which these structures in, are maintained, and, and we're providing recommendations, but there's, there's a lot of challenges. That, that we have to, to face. Uh, among those challenges, number one, if you think about the number of buildings in Florida that were constructed, say, between 1981 and the time when that new uniform building code that we issued in 2001 was released, that's a lot of buildings. I, I, if I had to venture a guess, I would say probably in the, in the thousands. Um, and flat slab was a very common mode of construction because it's quick, it's simple, and you can get more height and more floors because you have no beams, so your floor-to-floor -floor heights are, are, are less. Um, from an inspection and funding standpoint, um, these buildings in some way need to either be inspected or either need to be triaged in order to try to determine if there's any hidden conditions or any maintenance issues that may cause something like this. But one of the challenges is funding. A lot of the condominiums are owned by either retirees that basically either A, don't have the money to invest into continued maintenance, or, or B, they're not there. They're what we call the snowbirds. They're there half the time. And some of the other owners are investors, which own multiple units. So it's not in their best interest to invest money into that. So certainly a, 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 an issue that needs to be solved in the future, but I think we need to look more strongly at it, and hopefully our recommendations from our group will at least be implemented in part. Thank you, and that's it for my part. Thank you very much, Joel. Much appreciated. He's going to have a seat right here while we welcome our next presenters up. And these are going to be two of our representatives from Urban Search and Rescue Task Force 4, who are also members of our own Seminole County Fire Department. So please help me welcome Lieutenant Tripp Hansen and Lieutenant Matt Janes. Please welcome them to the stage.
Good morning. My name is Lieutenant Matt Jaynes. I'm with Seminole County Fire Department, and I represent uh, Florida Task Force 4. Um, we're made up of Seminole County Fire Department, Orange County Fire Department, and Orlando Fire Department. We each send about 30 members to make up our team, and we have affiliates from all across the region, which we would call it. So as far down as Mar Martin County, up to um, a little bit into Volusia. Um, what is a task force? A task force is basically a self-sufficient rescue entity that specializes in technical rescue and hazardous mitigation. So we can be deployed to hurricanes, we can be deployed to obviously building collapses, and we show up with no need or no burden on the local municipality. So we show up with our own lodging, our own showers, our own food, um, and our own tools and equipment. So basically what we're able to do is come in, allow the first in resources to leave and go back to running their normal 911 calls, get their rest and rehab in it, and then we're designed as a type three team to work within 12 hour operational periods. So we were assigned with Surfside down to the midnight to noon operational period. We worked from midnight till noon. Um, it was hard work, but it was good work for our whole entire team. During the deployment, I operated as a rescue squad officer. So what that basically means is I run a small squad of people made up of rescue specialists, a medical specialist, and some tech search guys. And they're the ones that will run the cameras. So we try to identify void spaces after our canines would search the pile and they would get hits. We would then try to make access to allow our, our tech search guys to get in with cameras and listening devices. And then our rescue specialist with the med specialist would work those areas to try to expose void spaces, expose potential um, survivable spaces, as we like to call them, and work through that. We did that for about nine operational periods, so about nine days, and then we were relieved by some federal teams that came in, and then we came home. And um, Lieutenant Hansen has a short video. He's one of our um, Tech Info planning specialists. So he's one of the guys that really kind of helps us map out where the areas we've searched and haven't searched. And he's able to use some UAS footage to show you a little bit of what we were working in during our period. You're looking at through the video, um, the end of our op period. So it was kind of nice. We actually got to watch the sunrise, kind of gave you a second wind. Uh, so you work all night and then you're ready to start getting tired. The sun would come up right there on the East Coast and uh, we'd work till noon. And, it started getting pretty hot and we were pretty tired and then so we were able to kind of go back. So what you'll see is some footage of the pile work itself uh, that the tower was, as mentioned, was a 12 story collapse. We had a, the still standing building as an issue for us and one of the nights we were pulled off due to uh, they, what they thought was movement in the tower. So we were evacuated from the pile and then multiple nights we were also evacuated due to storms and were in the immediate area, lightning strikes. So, but what you'll see is us also working with international aid. So we worked with the Israeli force. Um, that was interesting being assigned uh, an international team as an officer. It was, here's some guys, put them to work and they're very experienced in what they do. So um, we got to work very well hand in hand with them. So we have some questions at the end. We'll be glad to answer anything you have and I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Hanson with the video. All right. Oh, yeah. hey, who's on? All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Trip Hanson. I work with Matt at the fire department and also with uh, Task Force 4. So one of the things that we were able to do, as you can see in this video, uh, this is all shot by our UAS that we were able to take with us. Um, this just kind of gives you an overview. You see the crews, as Matt was saying, we're broken up. This is the underground parking garage we actually flew a drone into to take a look at, see what we could find. Um, it just kind of gives you a little, it, it, you can look at the pictures all you want until you're there. It really it hits you. I mean, but uh, as Matt was saying, you know, this event happened on June 25th, June 24th. Or, um, we were deployed down there. Within about 48 hours, uh, the, all eight, eight urban search and rescue teams for the state of Florida were on site. Um, quite the feat that's never happened before. So within, like I said, about a 48 hour period after the event happened, you had roughly 300, 400 USAR members on site. Didn't tax the local municipalities there. Uh, we were able to be self-sufficient, do everything we needed, anything they needed with help with obviously being on the file, doing searches. Um, so. No, we can answer any questions you have later. I mean, I said it's a, it was a significant event in Florida's history and not the nation's history, and we were glad to be a part of it. Um, it gave us all unique experiences, and we look forward to kind of sharing it that can help out any other potential things to make it go smoother if it ever happens again. I mean, unfortunately, it's 
you know, we're, we're there for the worst times in the state, and if not the country, we've also, our team has been deployed. We just got back from Louisiana with Hurricane Ida. Um, so, you know, we're, we're becoming more and more experienced with this, these kind of events, not just the localized building collapse, but hurricanes themselves would take, about, take out multiple buildings, not always with people inside in the middle of the night. Obviously, the loss of life was huge in this, with just the center of um, the amount of people in one building. So, you know, different events, but we're there, and we appreciate all the support we get from our local fire departments. We appreciate the support from just the people at home. And uh, they're constantly, once they're hearing about us, you know, what else can we do? What can we do for you guys? And that's the, that's the biggest thing that keeps us rolling. So, so. Okay. We'll get you at the end. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do questions at the end for everybody. We'll have our final speaker this morning. You know, we've, we talked about the collapse itself. We've talked about the rescue and then what happens in the aftermath. So uh, our final speaker this morning is Dr. David Rozek. He's the assistant professor at UCF Restores in the Department of Psychology at the University of Central Florida. So welcome to the stage, Dr. Rozek. All right, good morning, everyone. So I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of background on UCF Restores. Uh, we were also uh, deployed down there. Uh, I was actually in Utah when I got the call and took the next flight out from Utah down to Miami. Uh, but a little bit of background about us at UCF Restores, because not a lot of people know about what we have to offer and how we can be supportive in these types of situations. Uh, I'm not going to read you all these slides, I promise. I know I'm a professor. I won't lecture you that much. But we offer a lot of different things from clinical services we have a fully functioning clinic to kind of this one, uh, one session, a single session consultation, which I'll talk about at the end of today. We do peer support training for first responders to help them identify mental health issues, suicide prevention, and really kind of culturally competent training. And then we do uh, crisis situations where we're deployed as part of peer support as clinicians, uh, but really to support our first responders. So I always like to talk about this, and this is a great audience to talk about this. Uh, what people think mental health treatment is, is having a nice chase lounge. We don't smoke cigars anymore. Uh, I did want to say that I've worked at three universities, and I've asked for this chase lounge at each university. So if anyone's looking to sponsor a chase lounge, talk to me at the end. Uh, but no one has bought that for me. But I want to show you what mental health really looks like nowadays. And we now have technology, we can do telehealth, we can reach people all across the state of Florida. So they talked about how all of the different USAR teams are down there. We can now provide mental health services to them regardless of where they are within the state of Florida. Uh, I will say Chloe doesn't wear her mask while she's actually doing telehealth, but for the photo op she was. But the other thing that mental health looks like is this. You can see me in this picture where uh, we have Chief uh, Chris Bader, Dr. Deborah Beidel, Lieutenant Jeff Orange, myself, and Candace Oltz down there, we get deployed from a mental health standpoint and a clinician standpoint to help be supportive in these different critical incidents. Uh, so our mission really is what uh, kind of our motto is restoring through research. So everything that we do, we want to have a positive impact, but we want to make sure what we're doing is not harmful. We want to collect data on it so that we can provide the cutting edge mental health care and support needed in these particular situations. So getting kind of to the theme of what we're talking about today, uh, the Surfside Collapse, uh, as was mentioned by all of our speakers, the pictures don't really tell you how it feels to be down there. There's a lot of strong emotions from the people that were impacted, from the first responders, from the community, from the media. There's a lot going on in these types of situations. And so when we got on scene, this is what we were looking at day in and day out uh, and talking to the different people that were there. So people always ask, well, what did you actually do down there? What does a psychologist do? What does a clinician do? Uh, and I promise, again, we didn't have the Chase Lounge. That's not what we were doing. But what we were doing is we were providing psychological first aid. So we were there helping and supporting the, the first responders, the peer support teams. Uh, we wanted to make sure their needs were met, that if someone was having a tough time or struggling, that they had someone to talk to. Talk to. Uh, and we have really, really good, small, short duration interventions A talk for five, 10 minutes. We can actually do a lot to help these individuals to feel better and to kind of figure out also what are next steps. 
Uh, the great thing about kind of this event is there was a lot of support down there. So we had our clinicians, we had a full peer support team uh, from uh, the collaborative and IAFF. Uh, there were comfort dogs, there were chaplains, and we were all working together. Uh, we, uh, part of our job was to help with the demobilization, kind of go to different groups, all of the different groups, and just let them know what, again, we have to offer for kind of the longer term care. We know that these big stressful events can sometimes lead to things like PTSD, to depression, to anxiety. And we want them to know that one, that's normal, and two, there's something you can do about it. You don't have to sit there and suffer with it in silence, but instead, here are some very specific things that you can do and some people who understand kind of your background as a first responder. So one of the things that we wanted to let everyone know about when we were there is a project that we've been a part of called Redline Rescue, which is a website that for uh, firefighters in uh, EMS where they actually have a database, a searchable database of peer support people who you can contact. So you can search by location, gender, age, all these different things so that you can reach out and talk to someone. They also have a clinician database. And now these aren't just any random clinicians. They're clinicians that have had training to understand first responder culture. So that what we hear a lot of times is from these first responders is I went to a clinician and I told them what I saw and what I went through and five minutes in the clinician's crying. And now I have to act as the first responder to help them and get them through. What does that look like from a mental health perspective? That person's never coming back to see a clinician. So we want to make sure they see the right people. Uh, we at Restores are also doing a monthly follow-up for all the USAR teams, uh, asking them to fill out some measures of mental health so that we can reach out to them if we see something kind of increasing like depression symptoms or suicide or PTSD <laughs> symptoms. And kind of what our plan is and what we have to offer, I just want to talk briefly about two things that we do offer is we offer what's called the single session consultation, which is a 60 minute, one time, no commitment after that if you don't want it. We have same day appointments that first responders can call into. It can be in person, it can be via Zoom, again, anywhere in the state of Florida. And all of our services are free. So we got funding from the state and we get funding from uh, private donors to provide all of these services. But it, this is something that in the mental health world, it's almost unheard of to be able to have a same day appointment. And we have this available. Now we do do one two week follow up phone call for people who do the single session. We're not the car insurance uh, warranty people. We call you once and then we're done. Uh, but we do that just to say, hey, how are things going? And if things are great, great, we're still here if you need us. If things aren't going well, we can then transition you to kind of our full clinic that we have if you're, if you're wanting that. And so I just wanted to end with a little bit of data that we have from our clinic. We are very, very good at treating PTSD. Um, our treatment programs are really successful, especially within our first responder community. So people, uh, first responders who come to our clinic who have PTSD and complete our treatment program, 76% of them leave without a diagnosis of PTSD. So pretty darn good at what we do. And so we offer, again, all of these things for free, and we wanted that to be known to these first responders at Surfside so that if six months down the line something happens or they don't feel very well, they know that they have a resource and that uh, several of our clinicians were down there on site as well. Uh, and so again, I'll just leave my contact information up here, but that's kind of our goal and our mission is how can we support this? We know this is a big stressor, a big traumatic event, and we want to be there for these first responders. So thank you. I think it's really great to have the wraparound services finally acknowledged in mental health where uh, folks say, you know, it's free country, do whatever you want. Well, some of the actions that you take will have some significant adverse events on the first responders that have to respond to whatever idiot thing it is you did. And so um, whether it's a tragedy or intentionally self-inflicted, the first responders take the brunt of that. And so to have recognition of that is fantastic. So now's the point where we go to um, question and answer, Q&A period here. I think we'll probably turn the lights up if we can. Nathaniel's got the microphone. We have the first question right here. And so you can ask any of our four presenters uh, here today, uh, uh, whether it be structural, first responder, or mental health. Go ahead. We've got a question right here. 
Simple one. What did they do with the other building at this point in time? The other building was brought down, I believe, on day 12 or 13. The other day, it was because of the impending tropical storm. So that impending tropical storm with the instability of the building, and I'm not obviously a structural engineer, but I know that they weren't able to confidently keep searching the pile with that impending coming down. So they actually brought that building down with documentation and plotting. They were able to recognize where the existing pile was and then where the new debris was down. So they were to remove the debris from the existing tower and then refocus their searches once they met that level of initial collapse debris. So, but they did bring it down. Thank you. Additional questions, Nathaniel, you'll get one over here. This is for Joel. Um, you mentioned buildings that were built between 81 and 2001 in regard to the, the building code at that time for the flat uh, foundation. What about buildings prior to 81? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, th those buildings would have been constructed in a similar type of, of construction, and those buildings wouldn't have had the quality control that, that we have nowadays. So yes, I would say those buildings as, as, as well. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of coastal Florida was was built sometime between the the 50s and 90s. So so yes, I would say those buildings that predate that as well. They they usually weren't as tall, but uh, but they would be at at uh, at potential risk of a of a hidden defect at that point. And what the defect wise is in Florida, uh, particularly coastal communities, is that corroded rebar? Is it poor concrete? What is what are the issues with Sure. So, so it's all of the above. Um, you know, Florida, uh, Florida, Florida, as we all know, is a is a peninsula. So, so you start at the coast and you move your way inward. Um, not to get overly technical, but we have sort of corrosion exposure exposure charts. They range from one to five. The furthest point in Florida from the coast is probably a high three. So even here in Seminole County and in Orlando, there's still a potential risk of, of corrosion. As you get within three miles of the coast, there's an adverse risk. And, and, and what a lot of people don't understand is that in a lot of these high-rise buildings, the paint in the building, believe it or not, is actually the waterproofing. So if you don't do something as simple as paint your building every five to seven years, that coating of paint will diminish, and if there's a crack, Salt water will make its way in. It will corrode the rebar, which in case makes it expand. And when it expands, it starts pushing the concrete out. And once it pushes the concrete out, the steel is now exposed to the air and it accelerates that corrosion rate exponentially. So maintenance in all of these buildings is critically important. Additional questions? I know we've got Penny. Um, I just had one, uh, a structural one again. I, is this correct that I read after um, or heard it on the news that inspection for the buildings were every 40 years? Was that, is that, what do you do about that? That's ludicrous in my mind that you can wait. So is a new policy. We have a legislator here. What do you do about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll touch upon that from a technical standpoint, if I can. Um, <laughs> so, so that is correct. And just to clarify, the 40 years recertification process only exists right now in Miami-Dade and Broward County. Um, it's, it's not throughout the state. Okay, so, so it's mandatory in those two counties. Uh, it came about, uh, ironically enough, because of a building collapse in Miami and Miami or Miami-Dade County decided, gosh, we really should have these buildings inspected. And the 40 year was actually a random figure that came about because the building that collapsed was 40 years old. Um, so they implemented that, that, that regulation. And then I, I believe it was the late 90s to early 2000s, Broward County also jumped on board and developed their own 40 years. One of the tasks that, that at least our expert group has is to try to reduce the frequency of some of those inspections and make recommendations on that. And, and it's not just about frequency, it's about what components you inspect. Give you a few examples. Uh, I gave one earlier, the paint, okay? If you paint your building five to seven years, 
but you don't inspect the structure before you repaint it, you're going to cover the defects with the mm. paint, yeah. right? So, so some of those cycles have to coincide with, you know, with, with the maintenance of the building. Another example, roof. So if you, if you redo a flat roof every 10 years, okay, before you redo the roof, you may want to have an engineer or a forensic company check to see if there are any leaks before you put another brand new roof on it because then you're going to conceal those leaks and then they're going to become hidden and then they're going to do damage unbeknownst to the building owner and to any engineer at that point. Um, another good example would be windows and seals on windows, something very simple. Well, in Florida, we have driving rain, right? Whenever we get a storm, everyone's seeing it. If wind picks up, the rain starts going almost sideways. In a hurricane, in some cases, it does go sideways. Mm -hmm. so, if you're, so if you're in the coast and you haven't inspected your window seals after a hurricane, the winds from a hurricane actually rattled those windows and in some cases break the seals around the windows. So if you don't inspect the seals on your windows after a major storm, for example, there's a potential that those seals have broken and now you're going to get water inside your building and then in your structure and that's how you get some of that corrosion that develops over time if it's if it's not addressed so so we are working on it as far as a group we are going to submit recommendations for consideration and then hopefully from that point you know either legislation or the building codes or someone will take action on those recommendations Additional questions? Yeah, I got, I, I'm sorry. I, I got a quick one. If, again, to Joel, I apologize. <laughs> uh, but Joel, was so the actual trigger of this particular event that we're talking about in Surfside, what was finally the, the, the determinant study cause? So, so there's still an ongoing investigation. Uh, as, as you guys may or may not know, uh, NIST is, is involved in the investigation. As far as the causation, there's, there's still investigation to, to be done. Uh, as far as, you know, what we think, there, there's certainly contributing factors in any forensic investigation, and we typically, you know, the, the forensic engineers that are working on this, like NIST and some of the other ones, they're probably not going to discard them unless they have hard evidence or unless they, they can prove otherwise. But some of the major ones we can look at, uh, you know, maintenance issues with the, with the reinforcement. Um, we extensively reviewed the drawings as well. So, you know, the type of construction and, and the, the fact that there wasn't a quality control process during construction um, was also, you know, a potential contributor. The triggers is really what I'm looking for. There, there, in these types of collapses, there, there isn't inherently a single trigger. Uh, there, there's what we call contributing factors, and that investigation is still ongoing. So as far as the known trigger, I don't think that answer has been arrived at or, or even been publicly disclosed yet. Yeah. Additional question? Okay, we're going to break the cycle. I have a question for our Seminole County Fire Department guys. <laughs> so um, you, you said it was really cool that you got an opportunity to work with the Israeli Task Force team. What, if anything, did you guys take away from them or they took away from you as a result of that experience as far as maybe new techniques or learnings or whatever? I would say, honestly, what I took away from it was that there's people in this world that are meant to help people. And it doesn't matter where you're from, what you wear, what you believe in, that you're going to help people no matter what. So we came together. Um, you know, it was a brief introduction. They said, hey, you're gonna, we're going to assign these three guys to you. They're from here. I said, which one of them speaks English? They gave me the one that spoke English. And, um, you know, we went to work, and we really didn't have many issues. Um, there was some learning curves on the equipment. Um, they're not familiar with a lot of our equipment. So we had some quick safety meetings on, like, hey, don't do that, do this, let's work like this. Um, this is what we're trying to accomplish. But the drive was there for it didn't matter what you were wearing. So that was, you know, that's always a takeaway for me in any event I've been to is regardless of what you believe in, where, come from, you're there because you want to help people and you're not going to stop until you get your job done.
in any tragedy, it's always the good old Mr. Rogers advice, which is look for the helpers. Yeah. And the, there are people that are still willing to do it, and we're thankful for it. Additional question. Uh, surprise, I have a question for David, a mental health question. Um, <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the techniques that you use over at UCF for stores for PTSD, the virtual reality, and specifically what you're working on for Surfside? Yeah, so we uh, use two evidence-based treatments, so we know they work. We have the science to back them up. Uh, one is exposure therapy, uh, or we call it trauma management therapy, uh, that does use virtual reality. We've actually already set up Surfside scenes, so we had pictures, we have videos, and now we've made a virtual reality world where we can get people back into that scenario to help them manage and understand the trauma and really learn that the kind of fear that comes with it or the emotions that come with it, that they can come and go and they don't have to stay around. Uh, so we've put that together. We also have uh, what we call cognitive processing therapy, uh, which teaches people how to think more realistically. So when you're exposed to a trauma, people start thinking all of these negative things and they're really negatively biased. And it's hard to kind of think more realistically or balanced. And so we teach people how to do that. Now, I always like to be careful when I say that because uh, anyone that knows me is, <clears throat> excuse me, knows I'm not a positive psychologist in any way. I'm a very realistic thinker. And so we're not trying to retrain these people to think everything is sunshine and rainbows. Because if you ask these two guys, they'll tell you not everything is sunshine and rainbows in the world. But we want them to think more realistically about their experience, what happened, and how to manage those emotions. So. Excellent. We have time for one more question, if anybody's got a question. There we go. I got another one from the doctor. Uh, what do you see are the challenges in getting the mental health to the people that need it? So the, the biggest thing is, uh, are really are the number of clinicians and those that are trained in actual treatments that work. And that's kind of been the biggest barrier. Uh, the second piece of that is honestly the stigma of mental health treatment, right? Especially within first responder communities. Uh, so going to mental health providers sometimes comes off as I'm weak or I'm not good enough or people are gonna think I'm weak. Uh, and that's been one of our biggest barriers. However, us being kind of on the ground and being able to talk to these different groups has really helped break that stigma. And again, actually, uh, one of the positives about COVID is telehealth has expanded a lot. Uh, we're hoping some of those things change in terms of laws so that we can continue to do that post COVID. Uh, but that's allowed our center to actually reach out across the whole state rather than just the Orlando or greater Orlando area. And so those are kind of the two things I would say. Well, I know we're, we're out of time. Thank you very much for our presenters. You guys. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the Seminole County Chamber, please visit SeminoleBusiness.org or check us out on all social media at the Seminole Chamber.